right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you from a blue sky, sunny San Diego as usual. And today I am joined by Dr. Ivan Meisner, who is in Austin, Texas. How are you doing, Ivan? I am doing fantastic. Thanks for inviting me to be on. Yeah, and Dr. Meisner is the founder and chief visionary officer of BNI, the world's largest business networking organization. And before we're coming on air, we're just discussing about how they have remarkably reconfigured their business almost overnight uh, to meet the current uh, the current challenging situation, which is quite a remarkable achievement, and also shows how agile you can be when you want to be right. Yeah, I mean, we had to be pretty agile pretty quick. We moving nine thousand five hundred groups to online in just a matter of weeks was uh, was very interesting. But I got to tell you, I had a great CEO who saw this coming and was reasonably well prepared. Oh, that's fantastic! All right, so. Um uh, Dr. Meiser has written a number of books, uh, but the one that we wanted to focus on today was Who's in Your Room? The Secret to Creating Your Best Life. So um, let's just start off, Ivan, let's talk a little bit about what was the what was the genesis of this book and what's the thinking behind it? Yeah, so uh, the genesis was that it was a concept that one of my co-authors uh, talked about at an event. Uh, he and I are both members of the Transformational Leadership Council. Mm -hmm. It was started by Jack Canfield. And, and I heard him talk about it. I'm like, that is brilliant. Have you done a book? He said, no. And uh, he eventually asked me to join him and we did this book together. Uh, the key with the concept, and this is what I found so amazing, was the, the, the metaphor. Imagine that you live your life in one room. Mm -hmm. And that one room has one door. And that one door is an enter only door. So that when people come into your life or into your room, they're there forever. <laughs> you can never get them out. Now, luckily it's a metaphor, but if it were true, John, if it were true, would you be more careful about the people that you've led into your life? Oh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. That's, that's what everyone says. And we would suggest that it's more than a metaphor. And here's why. We interviewed Dr. Daniel Amen for the book, the brain scientist, uh, neurologist mm -hmm. from the San Diego area, as a matter of fact. And he, um, he said, when you have a relationship with someone, their fingerprints are all over your brain. You're going to remember that mm -hmm. relationship forever. So what I'd like you to do, John, and if you're watching this, I want you to think about someone that you got out of your life. Because people say, well, it's, it's a metaphor. I can get them out of my life. So I want you to think, John, about somebody that you got out of your life. If you're watching this, think about someone you got out of your life. Why did you want them out of your life? What did they do to you that made you want to get them out of your life? Think about something that really made you angry. Now, John, I'm not going to ask you to name the person. <laughs> but do you have somebody? Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a couple. Do you whatever. remember what it was they did? <laughs> Absolutely. So if they're in your head, they're still in your room. Mm -hmm. And they will be there for the rest of your life because their fingerprints are all over your brain. Right. And the truth is the room begins here and ends here. The mm -hmm. room is your mind. And so the idea is who are you gonna let into your life, into your mind, and how do you stop? How do you stop this revolving door that happens uh, when you're, certainly when you're young and you don't know any better and people just come in on their own? Yeah, and it's an interesting thing because uh, it's, it's funny, kind of the the pervasive culture, right? Uh, has it that you know the more the bigger your your circle of friends, you know, the more popular you are, the the, the better you are, right? I mean, we we tend to put it, but the reality is when you when you go through life and maybe gain more experience and gain a little more self awareness, you realize that in fact sometimes it's the opposite is true. Is that yeah. if you reduce it down to people who actually are net contributors to your life as opposed to subtractors. Yeah, we, we talk about it um, in the book as engines and anchors. Mm -hmm. There are people who are engines in your life. They drive you forward in a positive yeah. way, you know, and they help make you a better version of yourself. You're a better person when you're around them. Mm -hmm. And then there are anchors that just pull you down. And what you need to look for are the engines in your life and not the anchors in your life. Yeah, um, but isn't it isn't it funny that sometimes people will avoid the engines and they'll gravitate towards the anchors because it's it feels more comfortable there. 
Well, I, I think the people uh, end up with in, anchors in their life without really thinking about who mm -hmm. this person is and whether there's a good fit. And later they just determine that, oh, yeah, this person's, you know, I should have never let him into my life, but here they are. Now what do I do with them? Um, anchors are generally people that just bring you down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, many people have said you become the five or six people you hang out the most with. And so right. if you're hanging out with anchors, then your life is going to be pretty depressing. And if you're hanging out with mm -hmm. engines, you're going to be uh, having a great life doing being your best self. So one of the hardest things is, I think, for people, it is to do what you just mentioned a few moments ago, and that is to start to move people out of their life or out of their sphere of influence and and then move on with other people. But that part of moving people out, that's very, very difficult for people. Yeah. So again, I they, you know, you can't really get them out of your head. They're going to be there. Mm -hmm. So we, sure. to, to keep the metaphor real, what we do is we say, you know, something that my mom used to say to me. Uh, when I was a young man, take that problem, put it in a box and right. stick it up on a shelf. So you mm -hmm. take that that relationship, put it in a box and put it on a shelf. This is They're still there. You remember them, but um, you're not going to play with them anymore. So there's a couple of techniques that you can use to help you with this. One is um, the, co the concept of benign neglect. Mm -hmm. now, we all have people in our life that uh, we've lost touch with over the years, right? Yep. Uh, you know, maybe friends in high school or college, we liked them. It was a good relationship, but because of benign neglect, the relationships just, it just petered out. It's not the same. Yep. Now imagine doing that with a plan. That You have a plan to apply benign neglect to a relationship so that you get them, you're able to put them in that box and put them up. Now, the first step to doing that is treating people with, in, um, with homeopathic doses. Mm -hmm. A homeopathic dose is the minimum dose necessary to treat some ailment. And, and so imagine that you're, imagine that uh, I'm coming to San Diego. So I grew up yeah. in Southern California. I spent a lot of time in San Diego. If I were headed to San Diego, and if there were someone there that I didn't want to see that was mm -hmm. in my life and is in my room, uh, rather than let them know I'm coming two weeks <laughs> in advance, homeopathic dose, you know, I would send them an email the night before and yeah. say, hey, I'm going to be in La Jolla. Uh, I got a I got a 30 minute window. If you'd mm -hmm. like to meet, we could get together, have a cup of coffee. And um, chances are pretty good. They may not even read the email mm -hmm. <laughs> by yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. And if they do, I've, I've put guide rails around it where I'm going to meet with them for 30 minutes. And so you do these homeopathic doses where you can gradually let the relationship peter out. Yeah, no, that's a great piece of advice. It was uh, uh, instead of like being, you know, surgical, <laughs> yeah. maybe like just chopping it off. I know that's that's a really good uh, piece of yeah, advice. I don't, I don't like burning bridges, you mm -hmm. know, and so I don't like uh, chopping it off. And I, you know, I told my son about this this technique, and he, you know, he's a full frontal assault kind of guy, and he was like, "Just tell him you don't want to be with him anymore." Well, okay, um, that's not who I am, and I don't mm -hmm. like that that, you know, cutting it all off. I, I don't like to burn bridges. So this is a way of burning bridges, not burning bridges, but, but letting the relationship run its course. How much of this then is rooted in your own comfort with yourself and your own level of self-awareness? Because sometimes you will see people who surround themselves with a lot of people. And even when those people aren't always great influences, a lot of it comes stems from the fact that they're not good with being with themselves or comfortable yeah. just being with themselves. I think it has a lot to do with it. And I think one of the ways that you begin to uh, feel good about who you are and the kind of, the kind of person that you want to be is, and this is the, really the basis of almost everything in the book from mm. about the second chapter on is that you have to get good with your values. Right. If you don't know your values you're, you're going to really struggle. And when I talk to people, you know, and I, I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but when I say mm -hmm. to someone, tell me your top seven values, personal values, it's like, a, it's like watching a deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. uh, seven, eh, make it five. Um, honesty. Okay. That's one. Mm -hmm. Give me four more. Uh, and they him and they haw and they don't know, they don't know their personal values. And so if you don't know your personal values, you don't know what relationships will resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Relationships are resonant or dissonant. Mm -hmm. 
And, and what you want is resonance in your life. They, the values don't have to be the same, but they can't be dissonant with yours. And so when you get good with your values, then it's easy to look for the kind of people that you want to bring into your life that have values that are resonant. Now, here's an easy way to start. And I'm, I am going to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Before you start thinking about your values, and we have exercises in the book, sure. and you can go online and, and find a, a lot of websites to figure out what your values are. But here's an easy one to start with, deal breakers. When I ask people, what's a deal breaker? What's something in a relationship that you just, nope, not going to allow it. Um, most people can give a deal breaker really quick. Yeah, so yeah. can you give me one of your deal Oh yeah, breakers? dishonesty, absolutely, dishonesty. Okay, so dishonesty. And that's one common with people. Mm -hmm. um, here's, here, was, here was one of mine, drama. Yeah, that's people, a good one dripping in drama. We all have drama. I got a little drama. You probably have a little drama, but sure. I'm talking about the people. They always, there's always some drama going on. So they'd say in Ireland, hell together with a hell together with drama. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. I may borrow that Irish phrase. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> held together with drama. That's really good. So um, that was a, that was a deal breaker for me. And, mm -hmm. and, it, 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 it's a great way to then start thinking about what your values. You could also have couples values. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here's, here are, here's one of the couples values that my wife and I have. In terms of relationships with other couples, friendships with other couples, we've decided that we want to have friendships with other couples who both love and respect each other. Mm. If they don't treat each other in a loving and respectful way, that's a deal breaker for us. Now, look, couples aren't always loving and respectful. My wife and I, we've been married 31 years. There are times where, you know, we didn't fit that. But I'm talking about the norm. Yeah, yeah. We want to hang out with couples that love and respect each other. And so deal breakers are one of the things to look at. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think that's a it's a great piece. Well, there's a, there's a number of great pieces of advice there. I think the part on values is is absolutely. Uh, spot on because I do think most people don't sit down and figure out what their values are and your values today aren't going to be often the same as they were like many years ago but hopefully now you have a smaller amount and they're more solid yeah. but I think that but the other part is is deal breakers I really like that idea because I guarantee that's another thing that people probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about and they just accept people into their lives until they do something right. egregious right Right, exactly. And what you want to do is try to look for those kinds of behaviors early on mm -hmm. so that you can decide, yeah, you know, you're, you're staying on the porch. You're not going to leave room. You're on the porch because I got to work with you to some extent, but you're not coming in my room. So you have a chapter like assessing who's in your room. So if somebody gets into your room, right, how do you then, assess, because let's face it, there are people there who can be chameleons, right? And they can yeah. they can come into your room and they can reflect all of, looks like they reflect all of your values. But over time, you discover that that's not the case and they reflect everybody else's values when you're out of the room, right? Or when they're in another room. So how do you assess those in your room? Well, it's the benign neglect and the, and the uh, homeopathic doses. You also have to learn how to say no. And we have a whole section on how, learning how to say no without sounding like a jerk mm -hmm. or worse. And um, we, we quote uh, Steve Jobs, who once said, I'm more proud of what Apple has said no to than what Apple has said yes to. Because right. when you say yes to everything, you're just overwhelmed. And so you have to learn how to say no. Now, what, what do you say no about? You say no for the things that don't fit your mission, that don't fit your values, that don't fit uh, your vision of where you want to be as a person or where your business wants to be. And so the things that resonate with you are the things that you say yes to, the things that don't, uh, are the things you say no to. And so we try to teach people on how to say no. Here's my favorite technique. If John, if I said yes to the, if I said yes to you, I'm afraid I'd let you down mm -hmm. and then say why. What I love about that technique is I never even use the word no. If exactly. I said yes to you, I'm afraid I'd let you down. And I'm not looking to let anyone down, but that's what would happen if I did that. Now, a follow up to that is this isn't something that I do, but I know somebody that yeah. does really well. And I think they would be a better fit. Can I introduce you to them? So you refer them on over to somebody else. And we have like a number of techniques. The worst thing to do is to Seinfeld it. Remember the old TV show Seinfeld? Yeah, sure, sure. Where sure. they would 
go off on some extraneous uh, <laughs> they, oh you know my cat needs a whiskerectomy yeah, yeah. I mean and I had a car that they yeah. wreck, and they'd come up with all this stuff and yeah. that, just be honest be direct um, and, and be gentle yeah, because the trouble is if you start to go down that path of making up white even if they're white lies yeah. you, you have to continue to add to it in order to keep it going and then you have to remember what they were in the first place yeah, especially when somebody comes back and says, "Well, how's your cat doing?" And can I see your cat? And you're there. Shoot, and I don't have a whiskers. cat. <laughs> I don't have a cat. Um, and then what's it in living living in your room? Yeah. So I think that's the most important chapter. So uh, we we start by talking about the secret to balance. Mm -hmm. So John, would you like to know what we think the secret to balance is? I would very much like to know. Forget about balance. You'll never have it. <laughs> now, when I say that in a big audience, there's almost always somebody who goes, oh, man, uh, I going to get something good. All right. I think there's something good still coming. What happens is we look at life and we say our life is not in balance. And I think that's mm -hmm. a, a false measurement because right. balance is like scales where everything's got to be perfectly in balance and your business has to be in balance with your personal life, which has to be in balance with your health and your spirituality. And it's, if you, if you're in sales or if you're uh, an entrepreneur, your life's way out of balance. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have a different way of looking at it. I think and instead of balance, you need to be looking for harmony. You need mm -hmm. to have a life of harmony. Even the graphic, the logo, for harmony, the yin and the yang, mm -hmm. if you separated them, would be out of balance. Mm -hmm. But together, it creates a life of harmony. And so we talk about, this is more than semantics. What are the techniques that you can employ to create a life of harmony? And that's what we talk about in that one of the final chapters. Yeah, and I really like that concept of harmony because different parts of your life, different parts of your business, different parts of your purse will, will be bigger and smaller at different times, just like yeah. the, the, the yin and the yang, right? And, uh, and therefore, you want them to be able to operate harmoniously, as opposed to, as you say, balance is a very kind of, it's a one or the other, right? Um, whereas this is more fluid, and I think that's more. It's like when people say, "Oh, I just feel like my life is out of control. Like right now, I need to yeah. get control over." It. And you go, "You're never going to get control over. It. You don't have control over it anyway. You have control over bits of it, but not all of it." Part of that's mindset too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people say, "Oh, I'm so busy. I, you know, I'm, I, uh, yeah. I can't get control." So I learned that rather than say I'm so busy, I have a really full life. <laughs> Yeah. I do. I have a really full life. It's, it gives a different mindset. It's like right now we're doing this interview during the COVID mm -hmm. uh, pandemic, right? I hate calling it lockdown. Yeah. I call it the great pause. The great pause. Yeah. That's we're good. all, you know, kind of on pause and pretty soon we'll be able to hit the play button mm -hmm. and get back into doing business. But it's Kind of the way, for me, it's the way you frame things makes a difference in the results. Yeah, I think, so harmony, I think, so. I think, is possible. Would you like one or, the, one or two of the techniques to create a life of harmony? Yep. Let's finish with that. Go for it. The first is three simple words that are hard to do. Be here now. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are, be present. Don't be at work thinking about the time that you thinking about the fact that you didn't spend time with the kids last night, right? Or, or the spouse last night. Don't be at home thinking about the project that has to be done at work. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are, try to be fully and completely present to that. Now, no one's perfect at it, but you practice, you can get really good at being fully present, putting that issue that you've got aside and focusing on the here and now. That's so important for harmony. Here's one more. Learn how to both let go and hold on. Now, contrary to popular belief, you cannot have it all. People who okay. say to you, you can have it all are lying to you. Mm -hmm. I know some of those people and I promise you they do not have it all. I know somebody who talks about becoming a mega millionaire who can't make his mortgage. Mm -hmm. So, and this is before all of the financial crisis. So, um, you know, I, I, you can't have it all. 
But so, so you have, what do you want? You, you, if you, if you are good with your values, if you know your values, you hold on to dear life for those things that mm -hmm. are part of your values and you let go of stuff that's not resonant with your values or your mission or your vision for your life and your business. Let it go. So you got to learn to let go and hold on, but hold on to the right things and let go of the right things. Yeah, I love it. That's a, that's such a, a great, a great and really important point, I think. And I mean, a number of them there, like you said, is you can't have it all. I mean, I try to explain this to people a lot is like everything in life comes or compromises and that's, and whatever choices you make, you can't have it all, but you have to be good with the choices you make and and be good with the things that, as you say, the things that you let go are the things that you know you're not going to have because you're doing this particular thing. And I also like that idea of being present. I think it was uh, James Joyce called it like living at an arm's length from yourself mm -hmm. is when you're not living in the present, you're not being in the present, you're always an arm's length away from yourself. And yeah, and entrepreneurs and salespeople are, I mean, it's like the tail wagging the dog. They mm -hmm. feel like they're just being, you yeah. know, one way or another. And I get that. Uh, I found that I was more conscious of my life when I really tr learned to be present to that moment. And in that period of time, give everything uh, at that moment to the, to the situation. Uh, and, and life was better. And look, I, I, I have 3 million air miles on just a handful of airlines. And so I'm, I'm, I'm traveling all the time. And yet I have a family. And so I remember when my son was um, 17, he's 26 now. When he was 17, we were playing a game of Halo, and Johnny was kicking my butt in Halo. Mm -hmm, sure. And he, I looked at him and I said, uh, hey, buddy, was I around enough for you as you were growing up? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, you're around all the time. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know if you noticed, but I actually travel about every other week. I'm gone for you know, mm -hmm. days at a time. He's like, hey, I know, but I don't know. Um, it's like when you're here, you're, you're like here. Yeah. Can we get back to the game now? And I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get back to the game now. And I love that. I think that's so important that, that when you are here, you're here. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, listen, uh, Dr. Meisner, uh, everything yeah, about yeah, call this. Me, call me Ivan, please. I, I just like calling you Dr. Okay. Meisner. It's kind of good. No, Ivan. Um, all of Ivan's information will be in his contributor bio uh, along with this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your organization. Well, at BNI, for people that are interested in BNI, go to BNI.com. We uh, have transitioned to online. All 9,500 of our groups are online now. If you can go to BNI.com, uh, check out a group online. It's easier now than ever. You can show up to a BNI meeting and, and in your sweatpants, and nobody will ever know. Right? <laughs> so it's easy to come to the meetings now. And I've got a blog of all free content up at Ivan Meisner. Dot com, tons of free content. And of course, uh, world's, I mean, uh, who's in your room is on Amazon and yeah. in all book, all, most bookstores. Yeah, and I, I would highly recommend it. I think if there's one thing that you should really pay attention to, it's who is in your universe, because I, I just think that's so incredible. Two, two hours, yeah. boom, you're done. Perfect. And who doesn't have two hours right now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Listen, thanks, uh, Ivan, again for this. It's been fantastic. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.